We are in a sermon series about the predictable parts of each of our journeys, the way we kind of all find ourselves in different spots along the way in our encounter with God and in the call up to this life. And today we come to the part of the, the, of the, of the journey uh, that is uh, that I'm calling the stretch. It's what Martha set us up for today, that part where we, we know we're being called to what God is doing in the world and to a grander vision, which is next week's sermon, by the way. It's the happy ending or the grander vision or the transcendent thing that we're, we're, we want to keep out ahead of us, and we're always, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, the thing that we want to talk about. But there's a step in between where we are and there, and, uh, and it's painful to get there. So there's always this, this tension of, we're excited, and I uh, wish it were a little easier. That happened this week. Let me give you some examples as we celebrate our ministry in the last week. This week, our early learning center opened, uh, which is great, and we pray for the teachers and for the, the kids and the parents. And uh, we always joke that it either is like a cry fest the first day, and, and then it goes on for a while, or there is this glimmer of hope that every, it just sort of like gets off on the right foot, and there's not a lot of crying, and it continues. And then there's a third option, which is about a weekend, they all realize that this isn't just a one-time thing. They come and play at the church, <laughs> that this is every, you know, all the times, and uh, then they start screaming. So um, it was, it was hopefully the, the second option. So far, so good. It started off pretty well. There was only one little guy who came, uh, they, they walked him out, you know, by my office again and again, and you could hear him coming down the hall, and it was the only word that came out of his mouth. You want to guess what it was? Mama! And he just get into this, like, deep wailing. Uh, we just read about sackcloth and ashes. There is an element to life that it stretches us from the preschoolers to the parents, and Martha mentioned this, but you know, I've seen on Facebook and had conversations with a lot of folks taking their kid to college. We did it last week. Uh, Luke moved into his dorm room. The dorm room was, let's just say, not satisfactory. I'll don't, not go into details. There is a, not satisfactory. Uh, uh, there's a stretch in that. Uh, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's a cruel trick on us parents that we raise these children to be independent and launch them into the world and then have to watch it happen. And it's, it's hard. It stretches us. This week, Western Kentucky University uh, was getting ready for, uh, to start as well. And um, this is the, actually, we live on Chestnut Street now. It's the first time I've seen the sorority rush happen. Wow. I had to be on campus, and I'm going to tell you why. This is getting somewhere, but the, but the, the, the sidetrack story is that I was walking across campus. I didn't know it was bid day. It was bid day. <laughs> there were, uh, I estimated, about one million sorority girls. <laughs> and they were chanting and screaming and hollering, and it was fine. I was, and I, I, I saw them off in the distance, and I went, I skirted. You know, I was trying to uh, get around them. And I, I started down this... Um, sidewalk and I looked and they were all facing that way and then all of a sudden they turned toward me and they started walking and it was like I did this number like <laughs> I've never been so scared in my life I've never I've never had that much energy in my life too like something to behold but I was on campus uh, because a few a few months ago uh, we began having conversations with uh, Western with Dr. Martha Sales who is the Dean of Students and as we begin those kind of conversations and partnership kind of possibilities, uh, the question is, is there something we can do? Is there some, you know, some place that we could be beneficial? And then we try to listen. And so the trick is to kind of have some sense of why you're there, but to then to be re ready to shape and, and mold that. And I mean, that's how we started the foundry. That's how we got to the Megan's Mobile Grocery. Um, that's how we do things. Uh, so you, you listen to the person who's there. And so we kind of had an idea that maybe we would do like an adopt a student kind of thing, that we would ask you to come along a student, w alongside a student and walk with them. And we may get to that. They're, they're, this is all developmental. But in the first conversation, Dr. Sales said, how about you think of it this way? How about you think about adopting a group of students? Because there are groups that don't get a lot of support and attention on campus. And then she mentioned one of those groups. And that group, uh, they call the Beacon Project and includes students at Western Kentucky University who grew up in foster care. 
And uh, about a year ago, they went to Texas, and a little over a year ago, went to Texas and looked at a pilot program that they could start here. It's the only state school uh, in Kentucky that does this. They come alongside them and support them as they've, if they have gotten to that point and are making the effort, they want to do everything they can to come around them. And we said, uh, that sounds like us. Let's, yeah, we want to do that. So that's why I had to, to, to stretch and go around the sorority girls to get to an uh, event in which we welcome those students. Do you want to guess how many uh, students who grew up in foster care go to Western Kentucky University? 60. It's far more than I would have guessed. You know, so some of our, some of us, just a small group of us are kind of getting into this and taking small steps. Um, but we had um, um, Qdoba, actually, uh, not to advertise and figure out where you're going to go for lunch, but Qdoba um, <laughs> offered some food for that event, and um, we were able to provide some things as well and really just to be there, five or six of us to be there. But you never know how it's gonna go, right? So I'm standing in the door and this young lady comes in and within 10 minutes she told me her story. And she said, I showed up, I've never come to these things before. Uh, and she was an upperclassman. I've never come before because I just sort of didn't know what to do with that part of my story and I just kind of pushed it in the background. And, and she talked about her faith, she talked about campus ministry and she said, I've told my story, I've come to claim that. And so I'm, I'm here because I feel like it's important to be proud of who I am. And more importantly, that there are other people like me, that if, if they're doing this and if they're trying, I want to be there for them so that I can help encourage them along the way. There's an, there's an aspect of each of our stories where we could kind of not show up and just sort of fade into the background. And here's the thing, maybe nobody will ever know that's the story of Esther, isn't it? And, and when it comes down to it, uh, Esther's uncle says, you know what? Maybe this will work out. God's plans are bigger than us. It's not all dependent on you, so don't think it is. In that sense, it may come, deliverance may come from another place, but if you don't step up, we'll never know. And so there is a stretch to each of our stories, and it would be nice if it wasn't there in, in a sense, right? It would be nice if we could do the spiritual growth thing without the stretch, without the challenge, without the pain. Uh, you know, Esther, let me think, let's think about the story of Esther for a second, because it plays out like a high-stakes poker game. And, and really, you should go home and read the whole book of Esther, because it's, it's really dynamic. And there's, if you want to look through a humor lens, there's some, there's, it's, it's intended to be humorous in, in ways, and ironic. It's, it's definitely got irony, and there's some violence in there, too. Um, it is uh, a powerful story uh, that begins with Esther becoming queen through the most odd circumstances. The thing that's most important about this story in this high-stakes uh, poker game is that Esther doesn't have many cards to play. She has two. The first is that she's beautiful, and the second is that she's there. How many of us, when we think about the, hands, the hand that we've been dealt, kind of make that very short list? They don't have a lot to give. Esther, the whole point of Esther's moment for such a time as this is she got there in the weirdest way. It's not a lot to stand on. And uh, to top it off, the cards that she wasn't dealt, uh, she doesn't have a resume, she's not a man, she's not a citizen, she doesn't have a supportive family, she's an orphan, she's not wealthy, she doesn't have notoriety, she doesn't have marketable skills, she doesn't have training in diplomacy, and even as the queen, she cannot play that card to see the king. She doesn't have access without risking her life. And so at some point, Esther has one option, either to, to sort of fade into the background or to step up to the moment, to take a deep breath and play the cards that she's dealt. And so she takes the risk and replies to Mordecai's challenge as we continue the story. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Now, in the ancient world, they have a way of marking this part of the journey that I think maybe is is helpful and, and is lacking for us. 
in the, in the passage you just heard, in the, in the part that later read to us, there is sackcloth, there is ashing, there is weeping, there is public display of lament and mourning. We kind of don't do that, do we? We're a culture of pull yourself up by the bootstraps and push through and make it happen and put on a good face and trudge on. Wash your face. And that's in the story a little bit. Esther sends Mordecai some clothes and says, man, put yourself together. <laughs> and he's like, no, you don't understand. There is a place for this thing that stretches us past the point of just being able to act like it's okay. I wonder, maybe you found that point in your life. Maybe you found that point in the last couple years. I certainly have. That song that we sang, It Is Well, is the song that I play on the piano here at church when it gets too much. In fact, the staff has gotten to the point where if I go to the piano, then when I come back uh, from the, the sanctuary, it's like sort of my prayer time. When I come back, they say, is everything okay? <laughs> I played that song how many times, Martha? A million times in the last couple years. We are past the point where I can stand up in front of you and say, it's all okay, Right? I think we can say there's a bit of this in, in life right now that's a mess. And I'm past the point of saying that I, you know, I, I'm going to put on a happy face and pretend like I have it figured out or that I have done everything I can do in the last two or three years. I don't think any of us can say that. None of us know. We're in a different place. And there is a, a part of that that is to be lamented and to walk through a journey of grief and not to pretend. And then there's also a part of the journey where we step through that and, and, and say, yeah, and also. We can make all the excuses, or all, and list not really excuses so much as listen, list all the reasons why this does not make sense to press forward. It's better just to quit or to hold back or to let somebody else do it or not step up to the moment in whatever way that we can figure out. Because it would be nice if spiritual formation happened that way, right? Like, um, in this series, what we're talking about is how we're shaped and formed in the image of Christ for the sake of others. That's our definition of spiritual formation. I'm going to put it on the screen, actually. That's, that's what we're here for. This is what we're signing up for, whether we knew it or not. We're signing up for the process of being shaped into the image of Christ so that we can be, live the cruciform life, walk around as living reminders of Jesus, and stand on his grace alone with nothing else. And not even for ourselves, but for the sake of others. This is not a nice little spiritual self-help, self-promotion project. This is learning how to die for others. It'd be nice if that happened easier than it does, I guess is where I'm going. It'd be nice if it only happened through inspiration. It is nice to be inspired into action, isn't it? And, it, and, it, and it's a part of the journey. Sometimes you, you go to a concert, they talk about... Uh, what it's like to adopt a, a child from another country and you sign up for it and 15 years later, 20 years later, you have a, a daughter. That's, that happened to me. Sometimes you read something, you hear a sermon and it, you know, it just sparks something in you. That inspiration thing is, I mean, it's, it's powerful. It'd be nice if it only happened that way, right? It would also be nice if it only happened through the spiritual formation. When we say that, sometimes what we mean is go over here, read your Bible, pray, disconnect, go on a retreat, uh, take some quiet time, reflect, and that is absolutely part of the journey too, isn't it? It'd be nice if you could just disconnect from people, get it all figured out yourself, and then re-engage people and figure out what to do with them, right? But it doesn't all, you can't always do that, can you? There's an element of it that, of that when it comes down to it, I think what most of us would say about that definition of spiritual formation, of being shaped and formed into the image of Christ for the sake of others, is that we just kind of wish it were a little bit easier than it is. Right? It would be nice if it could happen, if growth would happen without the pain part, without the stretch part, without the element that puts us just past the point of being okay. And, it, and it's not it's, it doesn't happen. <laughs> There's no way around it. We can skirt it. We can avoid it. But eventually we find ourselves in the stretch. The good news is we grow in the stretch. We grow in that moment, in that point that just takes us just a little pet past where we want to go. 
And that's where we grow. Dang it. That's where we grow. It'd be nice if we could get smart without studying or have success without failure or, go, or get fit without going to the gym. But it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. There's a lady at the gym um, several years ago that had this shirt that she wore regularly. And it didn't say exactly this. I'll, I'm, it, I'm editing it for church. <laughs> but the shirt said, I'll do it, but I'm going to gripe about it. I also, when I used to swim, I had, there was a guy I swam with. Um, if I mentioned his name, some of you would know him. But uh, I figured that was his. He didn't have the shirt. He just had the motto in life. I'm going to do the workout, but I'm going to gripe about it. It would be nice if, if growth were painless. And most of us live in the space where we're going to do it, but we're going to feel like griping about it. And that's how we know. <laughs> that's, part of, that's part of the stretch. You can call that a lot of things. But one of the things we can call it is growth. One of the things we can call it is opportunity. One of, one of the things we can call it is our moment to step up for such a time as this. So we like it when it all works out in the end. Uh, you know, we, we like that story. I think about how this so- plays out in the song Amazing Grace. Let me just use it as, a, as an example of the journey because uh, we've been talking about how we have an encounter with God and then there's this initial resistance and then God's grace works in us and then we're stretched to this grander vision, which is next week's sermon, plays out in Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. God finds us. And the second verse, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed." There is an element of reliance here. My dad uh, was construction worker when I grew up um, and they we built uh, shirts construction by the way uh, built roof trusses and pole barns and my dad uh, had all the skills and the abilities to do that except for one thing he's afraid of heights and most barns need a roof <laughs> and so he his, part of his story and part of his faith journey is getting up on the roof and singing amazing grace over and over and over again And what I think that is, by the way, is more than just a song, more than just a mantra. It is us participating in the reality of grace when we we need it, when we have to learn to rely on it. And that's what happens in the stretch. You know, we, we, we like the last verse of Amazing Grace. Again, next week's sermon, that grander vision, that, that point where it's all glory all the time when it works out. In Esther's story, when the people are saved, and uh, the enemy is defeated, and it all comes together. Uh, I've been in a church service probably a million times where you get to the last verse of Amazing Grace. You know what this is like? Where it's like the, uh, the key change kicks in, and then the organ gets a little bit louder, and everybody kind of leans back, and you sing, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Who doesn't like that part of the story? You know there's another verse in there, right? <laughs> there's another verse. And um, actually, I, I, I've thought about this for years because I heard someone say, you know, in the, in the white church we sing when we've been there 10,000 years like we're belting it out. But in the Af- African-American tradition, it's this verse. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. It was grace that brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. That's what you get to in the stretch, that moment where it could be anxiety, you have this gap between where you are and where you need to be, and you can put a lot of things, anxiety, but instead you put trust. Dangers, toils, snares, crisis of faith, leap of faith, crisis of faith, test of faith, call it what you want, walking in the wilderness, walking through the valley. It is the stretch that teaches us to really pray. It is the stretch that calls us to really trust. It is the stretch where we find out what we really believe. It is the suffering that produces endurance, the endurance that produces character, and the character that produces hope. I don't don't know how you get there without the process. In a minute, we're going to sing these words. Take courage, hold on, be strong, remember where our help comes from. Our journey of faith will stretch us. Let's just accept it. In fact, we grow in the stretch. It's the only way we grow. 
But it's okay for us to say, I'm going to do that, but I'm probably going to gripe about it. That's where, that's where we will live. It's okay to acknowledge that that's what it feels like. I'm surely somebody is asking uh, at this point in the sermon, can you stretch too far? Anybody feel like that? Or this one. How many of you had this toy growing up? Let me see a show of hands. It dates you, by the way. It, 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 we know how old you are. And you might wonder, is it possible to stretch, stretch Armstrong too far? It's okay to say that some of us feel like and maybe are stretched too far. James Clear talks about this as the Goldilocks principle of stress in our life that there is an element in which we are stretched too far, and then there's a way in which we aren't stretched far enough, and the key is to be in the middle. Not too hot, not too cold, but just right. Not mom, papa bear, not mama bear, but baby bear. It's the Goldilocks principle, it's just right. He uses a sports analogy. We, we're swimmers, so I'll, u- I'll use this. Uh, um, the, um, the idea that you're in a race and that you're, you're going to sh- show up for the race, and when you get there, your competitor is a three-year-old kid with water wings on, right? I mean, is that fun to demolish the, the, the little kid who's in swim lessons? Maybe. Once. <laughs> right? But over and over and over again, it's just pathetic, right? But on the other end, if you, have, uh, you, you show up for the race and you look over and it's Michael Phelps every dang time, Right? How often are you going to keep showing up for that? Right? He's going to blow me away every time. For me, it'd be, I did have that race with my son. I taught him to swim, by the way. <laughs> Whispering Hills Pool, I taught that boy to swim. And then he whooped me. I was swimming as hard as I could. This was at a, a, a race aquatic swim event. I was swimming as hard as I could, and I swam in high school, by the way. Um, he was swimming corkscrew. Do you know what that is? Well, you just do this. <laughs> And he got there when I was, he got done when I was halfway done. Keep showing up for Michael Phelps. Life can feel that way. Eventually you're going to quit. The, the key is to have enough tension. Here's the Goldilocks principle. Uh, that It means that we experience peak motivation when working on tasks that are just outside of our abilities. It's a stretch. So as a pastor, as we think about our life together, I have a couple thoughts. One is that we need to be conscious of those of us who are being stretched too hard, who are about to be pulled apart. And we need to have ways in which we encourage one another and pray for one another. It's part of where we live. There's always somebody in that space because of health, because of their work, because of our life together as a church. It stretches us, and there are breaking points, and we found them. This week, as I was talking to somebody with a health Uh, issue, they said, you know what, you don't have to tell me that people are praying for me, though, because I can feel it. I was talking to someone who has some work challenges. Uh, It's just, the job has become completely uh, unmanageable in in, in the pandemic for a lot of reasons and worker shortages and things, and and she said, but you know what, Uh, I think people must be praying for me. In fact, I tell everybody that people are praying for me because... I should be freaking out right now. But I have peace that is, is just unexplainable. We need to encourage each other now more than ever because we're being stretched. And so if that's you, I want you to hear that encouragement today. You need to know that I'm praying for you. And at the same time, if we're going to be formed in the image of Christ, there needs to be enough challenge. Or said another way, we need to see that challenge as what it is, the opportunity to be shaped and formed in the image of Christ for the sake of others. And the surprise is the right right amount of stretch is what we're looking for. We think that we want it to be easier, but the truth is that's not when we're happiest. That our satisfaction, in in fact, is tied to being able to step up to our moment (laughs) because that's why we're here. That's why we're on the planet. The easier thing is a cop-out. It is not what we need. It's not what we're looking for. In other words, we need the satisfaction that comes 
with stretching ourselves for the sake of others, to go through the process where you actually care about people and you actually love people and you actually step up to the moment and to the opportunity of your life. I saw a video recently about that switch, about offering up what you have. It made me think of Esther. What you're going to hear in this video is something that's being offered up that may not seem like a lot, but the switch of taking it and using it to give made all the difference. Let's watch. People ask me all the time, Michael, what was your big break? Our next guest has performed on Comedy Central's Premium Blend. He made his first appearance on The Tonight Show from the Montreal Comedy Festival. You've seen him on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. That wasn't a big break. The big break was at a club. And right before I got on stage, I had a change in mindset about comedy. Normally when a comedian gets on stage, he wants to get laughs from people. And I felt a little shift take place where I felt like I was to go up there and give them an opportunity to laugh. Now I'm not looking to take. I'm looking for an opportunity to give. This changed everything. My name is Michael Jr. I'm gonna do some jokes. And ultrasounds come in color now, which is ridiculous. I know it's a black baby. It better be a black baby. I leave the club that night, and there's all these people giving me hugs and high fives, telling me their favorite jokes. Then I look across the street, and I saw a homeless guy. And I thought to myself, what about him? Most comedy, most jokes are set up. My son, four years old, looks at me out of nowhere, and he says, Dad, I want to be a doctor. I was like, yes, yes. And then a punchline. Then he said, or a dinosaur. <laughs> I understand that me doing comedy and doing all of these TV shows and making all these people laugh is really just a setup. My punchline is to make laughter commonplace in uncommon places. We go to Montrose, Colorado, a place called the Dolphin House. They take care of children who have been abused by their parents. And this grandmother explains to me that her um, grandson is being abused by his mom. He's so afraid of his mom that everywhere he goes, he wears a Spider-Man costume. So I get on stage, sitting right up front, Spider-Man. I start doing comedy. People start laughing, slowly but surely. Probably about 25 minutes into it, I hear a voice. And the voice says, my name is Ronan. And this little boy pulls off his mask. And it was one of the most powerful moments in my entire comedy career. If we could just stop asking the question, what could I get for myself? and start asking the question, what can I give from myself? I think people would learn that you don't have to be a comedian to deliver a punchline. It's really what I want to get across to people. And I think I just did. I looked at the camera again. I don't know if I was supposed to do that. We're going to take up the offering and have a, a moment of closing in worship, but it seemed appropriate that we do the offering now because... That's what this story is about. And so um, I'm going to confess along with you that, it's, that I've been doing it, and there have been times I've been griping about it. And you probably have too. And probably, I know, I know your stories. There's good reason. So we're going to just accept that as part of the journey. And also renew our faith that we would step up to the moment that we have now. And there are, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of good that's coming as we do. So let's pray together as we reflect on this part of the journey, the stretch. As we think about the hand that we have been dealt in life and in the last few years. As we think about our own particular set of challenges the ways that we've been stretched. My prayer first is for the person in this room who, who's been stretched so hard. Hmm. God, would you come alongside them and let them know that they're not alone? Would you give them what only you can give them, which is 
a story grounded in your grace, your amazing grace that we participate in. It's the, the, it's the foundation on which we stand. And, the, and, and it's grounded in the trust that there is always enough grace. There's always enough. God, my prayer is also for the person in this room who knows they've just got to step up and it's hard. And we're not going to say that it's not. We don't have to pretend that it's not. In fact, it would be so much easier just to fade into the background. But we know that we know that we know that, that they're here. we're here for such a time as this. So would you give your strength for that as well? In fact, would you make us be a community of people who live in the stretch who are always just a little bit outside of what we would rather do. In that sweet spot, that Goldilocks spot of being stretched enough that we grow. Would you shape and form each of us into the image of Christ? And we offer ourselves up to it, knowing that it's not gonna be easy, but knowing also that there is a grander vision that we're offering ourselves up for each other, for others. So would you give us the strength and the courage to do it? Would you teach us to rely on one another and not pretend like it's easier than it is? Would you help us to ask for help and may we be a community of people who come around each other as each one of us stretch? Help us to lift our eyes and find that this is really about your mad love for us would fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and run the race that's set before us. That we would have courage, that we would have strength, and that we would step up to our moment to live for such a time as this. We pray it in Jesus' name.